Hi, my name is Juliet Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote. This podcast has been brought to you by the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. To learn more, visit www.thecgo.org. Welcome back. Everyone, you know what I think of free speech. You know I love it. And its placement in the Bill of Rights of our Constitution should be enough to indicate its importance. But here I am talking about how much I love free speech. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome back Jonathan Rausch to The Great Antidote. In our first interview, we talked about cancel culture and free speech, which if you haven't listened to it, you really should. I was so energized at the end of our conversation that I spent the entire rest of the day bouncing around talking about what I learned to anyone who would listen. People were interested, but not bouncing around interested. Needless to say, I'm excited to talk to him again. He's a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings, and he is the author of many wonderful books, including Kindly Inquisitors and his new book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome, Jonathan. Happy to be back. So first, I've asked you this before, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Well, I wouldn't say that everyone doesn't know this, but it breaks my heart that so many people your age think that free speech is antagonistic to social progress, social justice, and minority rights. Nothing could be further from the truth. I say that as a homosexual American born in 1960 who won legal equality and ultimately the right to marriage only because of freedom of speech. That is a great response. And I think, I don't know, your personal aspect of it just hammers home this point of how important it is. Okay, so why do you feel the need, there's a need for your book today? After all, I'm guessing there never really was a time when anyone outwardly was defending lies and falsehoods. And the title is, quote, a defense of truth, and quote, not in defense of the truth. In your mind, is there a difference between the two? Well, I don't know about in defense versus a defense, but I thought this book was needed because we as a society in the West, liberal West, small L liberal, classical liberal, all of that, you know, that's democracies that care about minority rights and have constitutions and and so forth. We're facing a massive informational assault from some very sophisticated disinformation operators and cancelers who are very good at manipulating our information environment in ways that amplify themselves and disadvantage truth, um, chill free speech, cause massive disorientation and confusion for political gains. And we need to understand what they're up to and what are the loopholes that they're exploiting. And to do that, we need to understand where knowledge comes from in a society that is free and peaceful and reality-based. And the answer is, if you ask most Americans, they'll say, comes from the marketplace of ideas. Free speech, you know, it's a wind-up toy. You wind it up, you have free speech, then you have a marketplace of ideas, and truth rises to the surface. Well, guess what? It doesn't automatically. It turns out you need all kinds of institutions, norms, structures, incentives, all kinds of complicated stuff to turn the noise of free speech into that rarity, that precious rarity of knowledge. And how do we do that? Well, it's a constitution of knowledge. And it's not a metaphor. It may not be written down on paper and ratified by states, but it's a real constitution, which like the US constitution, forces people to go through certain protocols to make knowledge and forces them to compromise and persuade each other in order to make knowledge. That's where knowledge comes from. That's what's under attack. So we need to understand the constitution of knowledge and we have to defend it. In your book, you write, quote, 
over the years, I came to believe that the framework of kindly inquisitors could be strengthened by paying more attention to the institutional and communitarian foundations of collective inquiry, end quote. So what is the constitution of knowledge and why is that needed in conjunction with free speech? Free speech just gives you the input. It puts all the possible ideas and hypotheses out there. And on any given day, 99.9% of that stuff is just crap. You know, it's just people, stuff that people say and people think. The really hard thing is to filter through it all and find those rare gems that are new knowledge. And boy, are they rare. They are, they are needles in haystacks. And to do that, you need a whole system that keeps people anchored to reality by forcing them to propound their ideas in a way that can be criticized, commented on, contested by other people. And then you need a bunch of institutions that structure that. The big ones, there are a lot, but the big four kinds of institutions in the knowledge-based community, the reality-based community, as I called it, number one, science, research, academia, that one's obvious. Number two, journalism, mainstream media, all the fact-based stuff, that's the world I'm from. Number three, law. People don't often think about this, but actually the notion of a fact predates modern science. It comes from the law because you need to establish facts in order to have justice. And number four is government. A government has to be reality-based or it's just capricious and tyrannical. It can say and do anything once it's unmoored from facts. So you've got to have all of those institutions. We're talking about everything from University of Virginia Brookings Institution, the Atlantic, um, the FBI, the CIA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and thousands and thousands of others, all highly structured, full of experts, and lots of protocols that you need to go through if you want to advance knowledge. That's where the magic happens, in the institutions. And that's what I missed in Kindly Inquisitors, which is more the old-fashioned model of Marketplace of ideas, criticism automatically happens, and poof, we're there. So this production, I mean, as you were saying, requires a lot of institutions and social norms and unwritten rules. It's kind of like what Deirdre McCloskey talks about, where you need tolerance and a change in disposition of innovators in order for innovation to become accepted and for economic growth to kind of kickstart. In other words, it's not just about having the First Amendment, but having a culture of tolerance, free speech, and truth seekers. You've given the example before that the COVID vaccines, which are great scientific breakthroughs, that they aren't just the product of smart people, but of a constitution of knowledge and a social process where we outsource ideas of reality to a network of tens of thousands or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people who are looking for each other's mistakes in a structured way. It's kind of where scientific knowledge comes from. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you just did it so well that, that I'm not <laughs> sure I have to. But yeah, there's, there's some really unique attributes of the constitution of knowledge and the reality-based community that provide them with advantages that no other system can come close to matching. So for about the first 200,000 years of human history, the way people get knowledge and is, well, first of all, most tribes, societies, groups, large or small, need some way to come to some kind of common account of belief and facts. Uh, if they don't, they schism and then they go to war. And that's actually a lot of the way that humans over history have settled differences of opinion. You know, Protestants go to war with Catholics and Muslims with Christians and, and that sort of thing. So first of all, you want to avoid doing that. But second, we used authoritarian models. We'd settle our differences of agreement by going to the prince or the priest or the oracle or the sacred text. And that just embedded our mistakes. So along comes, you know, starting 350 years ago, but really accelerating around the same time as the U.S. Constitution, we get the Constitution of Knowledge, which says, wait a minute, instead of having decisions about what's true and false made by rulers, let's use rules and let's make them impersonal rules so that anyone can submit an idea in this system. But there are going to be two overarching rules. First, no one gets to shut down the debate and say, we're finished, we found it, we're done. No one else can add anything. That's no final say. 
also known as fallibilism. That's the notion underlying science that anything in principle could be wrong. But then you don't want chaos. You know, you don't want to get up every morning and have to reprove the law of gravity or whatever. You need a second rule just as important. It's the empirical rule. No personal authority. The only way to make knowledge in this environment is to check it with other people with different perspectives. And the experiment you use, the argument you have recourse to, the facts you rely on, they should all be work regardless of who's trying them. The identity of the person shouldn't matter. Where they are, the language they speak, their political views, their race, class, ethnicity, none of that should matter. Juliet should get, in principle, the same results from the experiment that Jonathan gets. Jonathan should be able to check Juliet's facts. Well, what does that do? This is a revolutionary concept because it obliterates the notion of tribe in the world, world of knowledge. And it says millions, in fact, billions of human brains can participate in a global network of checking each other on any matter at any time. And then you add these institutions that we talked about earlier. That's everything from newsrooms to you know peer review and fact checking and journals, all of that stuff. When you add that to the mix, you get a global network of people and institutions that are capable of surfacing hypotheses at a fantastic rate, finding the errors very quickly, and sifting that into knowledge on a global scale. And when needed, they can pivot in a matter of hours to analyzing a new virus so that over a period of days, you get its genetic sequence. Over a few more days, you have a virus design. This is a global hive mind that far transcends the abilities of any one human being or even group. It is humanity's greatest invention. It has literally transformed our species from small and ignorant tribes or even large and ignorant tribes to this global mind. Um, that's what we've accomplished and that's what we're defending. So can you give us some examples of the constitution of knowledge at work, either in our lives today or just in the past? Where to begin? Uh, <laughs> one, <laughs> one example is me as a journalist. I entered journalism in the early 1980s. And the first thing I learned was that there's going to be a lot of structure. I couldn't just write anything I thought and put it in the newspaper. I wasn't supposed to single source. I had to have multiple sources. I had to check with editors. Um, I had to wasn't didn't have specific fact checkers, but we had editors who would back me up. There were lots of rules, not paying sources, for example, running corrections if we get it wrong. We understood that it was undesirable to make a mistake and to have to run a correction, but we also understood that it was honorable and important to correct ourselves if we were wrong. We learned that we serve the truth, not any particular political goal. We learned to write ourselves out of the story so that what we write should be true regardless of who's looking at it. And that's just journalism. I mean, think about what you have to do to become, a, say, a doctor or a lawyer, or a physicist or a biologist, or for that matter, a literary critic. Uh, you're going to have to master a whole field, show you understand the literature, get a PhD potentially, get all your articles fact reviewed, be able to write articles in certain ways so you can state hypotheses and make arguments for them so anyone can check them. And then here's the hardest part of the constitution of knowledge. You're going to have to abide by the results, and you might not like the results. If you're one of the scientists who thinks that, I don't know, the ice age or climate change kills the dinosaurs, and the scientific consensus over time moves to thinking, nope, it was an asteroid, you know, you don't have to change your mind personally, but you're going to have to live with the fact that you lost the social argument that knowledge, what's in the textbook, may be something that you disagree with or don't like. Well, creationists are not willing to do that, but good scientists, good lawyers, good journalists, um, all of us are, or at least we try to be. I kind of want to move on to the aspect of the constitution of knowledge in like hand in hand with free speech on college campuses. I recently went to college. I just finished my first semester about a month ago, and so I'm back home right now, but I've been reflecting a lot on my time there, even the little time that I have been there. And it's interesting because FIRE rates UVA, University of Virginia, as one of the best universities for free speech. Yet 
we really don't have that much free speech culture and no one is really interested in finding new ideas or contradicting their own thoughts or finding out if there's a better way to do something or any of that. And so no free speech happens because people are either too scared to say anything if they disagree or they just don't care to learn more or to challenge themselves. By people, we'll, we'll invert the interviewing for a few minutes if it's okay, because <laughs> yeah. it's so important to understand what's happening in universities. Universities, uh, all of the institutions that I mentioned are important, but the long pole in the tent, the single most important is the university, because that's where the bulk of the research happens. And it's where the next generation is trained in the values of the constitution and knowledge. It's really the the cornerstone or maybe the, 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 the what's the word for that piece of the arch? It holds it all uh, together. The keystone. It's the keystone institution. Yeah. Um, so when you say people are feeling chilled and unwilling to speak out or maybe apathetic, are, are you talking about students or are you talking about professors or both? Both. I think either, I don't know. I honestly, I could not even tell you what the political makeup of my school is because no one talks about it at all, unless you're specifically in a club. But even there, the people that are in it are minor and professors do talk sometimes, but it's rarely, it's very much restricted and almost as though they're afraid of saying anything. So I don't know, everyone. So, and the subjects here would be, are all subjects chilled or certain political subjects? Practically everything, I would say. Anything that could have a stance taken on it, I would say. It's kind of, it's kind of disappointing. So are there things that you would, subjects that you would feel afraid to raise or that perhaps others feel afraid to raise, say, I don't know, affirmative action, race, or is it pretty much anything? Is it like all small talk all the time? It's, so I would say a topic like affirmative action and race and taxes, something like that. Those sorts of things are definitely worse in terms of, oh, well, if you talk about it, you're really taking a risk. But even I mentioned something, I went to a talk about uh, the government response to COVID. And I came back and I was telling a few of the girls I live with about that. And they were like, oh, like, where do you learn that on Facebook? Like, Rrr. and I was like, uh, okay, all right. Uh, no, actually, I learned it from a professor who has been studying this for since the beginning of COVID. So I don't know. It kind of small talk even, I would say, but not not as bad as the bigger, more political issues. What what is it people are afraid of? Or maybe is it not fear? Is it apathy? Is it fear? And if so, what are they worried about? I'm not sure. I mean, for me. I thought I could just go into college and this has been kind of a, a shock, a disappointment on my part because I was like, oh, like I'm not afraid to say what I have to say. But in a way, these are all completely new people and I have no idea what the social consequences will be, right? And so in a way, it's as though no one cares enough to learn or to challenge themselves. So they're not willing to talk about why you think what you think if you disagree. So in a way, my fear or my my aversion to talking about this comes from the fact that they don't care enough to give me a chance. And so if I say something, there's very much a possibility that they'll just take what I say for what they hear, which might not even be entirely what I said, right? They could hear it differently, interpret it differently from what I actually said based on their views but also that they just assume why I believe that, where that belief comes from, what else I believe, because they're not willing to question it farther than that. And you've actually, you've tried this experiment. You're not just guessing or what? Yeah, I've tried it a few times. And I mean, I wish, 
I haven't tried it as much as I would like to, to be able to certainly call it an experiment because this is off of like five trials, which science tells us is not enough for it to be super accurate. But I've tested it around with a few different groups of people and the response more or less seems to be the same. And I'm sure there are pockets of people that don't act like this, but I would say the overwhelming majority, this is the sort of response that I'd get. Yeah, I'm sure there are places like, I don't know, the Foreign Policy Club where you could go and have conversations of a more substantive nature. But but what you're describing sounds like an environment that might be characterized as anti-intellectual, not just sort of either politically correct on the left or or chilled on politics, but but kind of um, either uninterested in um, intellectual topics and conversations that grapple with ideas or downright hostile to them. It's disappointing because, I mean, as you said, it's where the next generation learns the constitution of knowledge. And that's kind of, that is where you have maybe the most or the most accelerated rate of growth in your interests and who you are and all of that. And it seems as though everyone is entirely disinterested in not only learning, but growing. Because I would say that intellectual interests and learning about the world around you is super important to becoming who you are. And so I can only, I don't know. I don't know what the implications of this are. Well, I can tell you that I went to a different school at a different time 40 years ago. Um, but I used to say that I got I got a lot of education from the classes and professors, but I probably got even more of my education from the other students because people were constantly talking, arguing about issues, trying arguments. Um, and it was a very different climate because it was certainly not anti-intellectual. And it was also compared to today, at least very unafraid. We didn't have social media, so people weren't weren't worried about being dragged on on Facebook or Twitter or any of the other social media platforms. Um, and I can tell you, you're missing out on a lot. You're missing out on what for me is like 50% of the value of, of a college education, um, those kinds of conversations. But what about the classroom though, Juliet? Is that any different? I think you're describing the social life, right? But, but what happens you know, in a class, would a, would a professor try to spark a a real exchange of ideas and views? And if so, what would happen? So UVA, is a, it's a really big, I mean, a lot of people say it's not a big school, but my smallest class was 30 people. And on average, I had 150 people per class last semester. And that's just a lot of intro level classes. So obviously, I will be in smaller classes in the future. But it is really difficult in a class that's really big. And one of my professors um, in my philosophy class, his name is Lauren Lemaski, he he decided that one day it was time to open and try to talk about why people should question the debate of critical race theory from either side, just to question what people are arguing and what people, how much people understand about their arguments from either side, really. And I thought it was very well done. He didn't make his stance very well known, but he was just like, you need to be critical and you need to think about what you believe and actually be able to stand by it. And there are professors who do take the time and have the made the effort to encourage this sort of thing. But on average, it just doesn't seem to be the place where professors either feel comfortable or have the time or the flexibility to do so. And we're students, so obviously, you know, students have different views, different feelings. But when Professor Lomaski opened the floor that way, did students respond actively? Did they participate, at least enough of them to create a real sense of conversation or dialogue? Yeah. I mean, we didn't have that much time. We had about 10 minutes and it was a class of 120 people. So there were a lot of people and we were trying to keep it an open group discussion as so that everyone could hear one person talking at a time. So we really didn't have that much time, but 
whoever wanted to talk would just raise their hand and participate. And we got a good amount of different responses, questions, all that sort of stuff. And it was a very open environment, I thought, which is not what I've seen in other places. So it was just really interesting to be there. Well, that's in one way encouraging. In another way, it's discouraging. What's discouraging is that it takes, apparently, based on your experience at least, it takes a professor deliberately creating a specific kind of environment in order to have a real change, real exchange of ideas. On the other hand, what's encouraging about it is that students responded. And um, I go to universities and speak about these issues sometimes in groups of students that are not super big. And I always find that after an initial period of hesitation of like, well, is this really safe? Is this really on the level? Students are eager to engage ideas, uh, to explain, to talk about their own experiences, and to put those in a larger context. Um, It's usually difficult to end the class because so many people want to get involved. And what students are telling me, and also pollsters, it's not purely anecdotal, is that on university campuses today, um, you know, there there used to be this notion, uh, tenured radicals, which is that tenured T-N-U-R-E-D, which is that professors were left-wingers who were using their classes to indoctrinate and berate their students into being left-wingers. And that appears to be, if anything, the opposite of the truth, that professors of both left and right are working very hard to try to create environments in the classroom where people can have the sort of experience that you just described. Uh, And that the bigger problem is outside the classroom, that students are very worried about getting dragged on social media or finger snapping or eye rolling or just hitting a brick wall if they raise these topics, so they're avoiding them. I talked to uh, one student who recently graduated from you know, a major Ivy League university. This is an outspoken guy, you know, a STEM major, and you know how they can be. <laughs> and, um, but he said that he, he just made it a rule on campus never to talk about race, class, gender, or any of those whole area of, of issues. And I said, why? And he said, it's all downside. You can only get in trouble for doing that. Now, this was a major Ivy League university. This is the kind of place that's supposed to pride itself on being an open environment for for exchange of views, structured exchange of views. That's where knowledge comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Um, It was shocking to hear that, but I've heard it again and again. I'm hearing a different version from you, which is that it's not so much limited to specific topics being chilled for fear of political disapprobation, that it's more of an environment in which people are not receptive to intellectual exchange for whatever reason. And that seems strange to me. Like, you know, they're paying a lot of money to be there. And whenever I give students an opportunity to have intellectual exchange, they want to do it. So what's going on there? I realize you're only a freshman, fresh person, but do you have any sense of what's, what is happening? I have absolutely no idea. All I can think is that it's getting so, I don't know, that these stories get repeated and repeated. And so even if you haven't experienced it yourself, you can kind of tell going into this environment that you can't talk about this, that, whatever. And also the fact that the minority that kind of pushes the getting in trouble, we will get you in trouble. You can't say that it gives them power that everyone is so afraid. So then why not extend it to everything else? I'm not sure. That's just kind of my theory, but it's not very well developed. Mm. What, what should maybe, okay, let's start in person, not online, not social media. What could someone like me do to try to foster an environment outside of the classroom to kind of fight for the constitution of knowledge, for actual freedom of expression? Well, of course, I'd be inclined to ask you that because you're an actual college student. And I think the 
solutions and approaches will have to come from your generation. It's it starts from very different priors than my generation. We just assumed free speech was a good thing and important and college in my day was was a place where you didn't get in trouble for saying controversial stuff. I mean people you know, people would be very critical of you and sometimes hostile to you, but nothing terrible would happen. You weren't going to be investigated or drummed out of school, or people weren't going to say you make their environment unsafe, and so you don't belong here. Um, so I come from a very different world, so I would want to turn that around. But as a starting point, I think I would say the first thing to do is find allies. UVA is a big place. I guarantee you, you're not alone. A f- close friend of mine's a recent graduate, I guess 2021 graduate. Um, and he found conversation partners and thought partners who were interested in, he was interested in specifically in foreign policy, international relations. He found those people. They actually started a podcast. It's a really good podcast, quite sophisticated. What's um, it called? I don't remember. I can find out. Uh, they also uh, they they clustered I think around one or two professors who they had studied with and created kind of a salon environment. So they began to create a nub of people interested in an idea or a topic, and then build out from there. You you can't do it by yourself or just encountering I assume encountering random people in the hallway uh, when you're back at school and say, uh, so what do you think about immigration policy? But you can find groups and allies and build out from there and expand those groups. So in terms of your personal life, that might be where to start. And it's kind of what we all do in college, right? It takes a while to find your group, to find your place. And even on, you know, Yale or Harvard, there are a lot of people who are not there for intellectual conversation. They're there to get a credential and, you know, get into law school or whatever. So there's always this question of finding finding your tribe, your group intellectually. Um, but that sounds like it's harder than it used to be. And then more broadly, can you can you work on the climate on campus as a whole? And and there, um, if the policies are good, I guess I wonder if there are ways to elevate these issues. You know, maybe maybe when you feel you have. Um, the ability, the the access to, for example, student media, or even on this podcast, to elevate this problem and say, "Look, uh, we have uh, our our rules may be fine on paper, but we have a real cultural problem at UVA. We're all acting like we're afraid of each other, afraid to have conversations. Um, we're shortchanging ourselves. What are we going to do about that? Maybe there's a way to range raise that, but I don't know." I will definitely look into it. I feel like since that's what I want from my experience, I'm going to take it upon myself. I'll find people. I'll recruit people for my mission, but I will figure it out. Uh, So another important aspect of your book and something that really is also just an issue everywhere. Okay. The constitution of knowledge is under attack on two fronts. Cancel culture, which is a big issue, especially like as we were just talking about on college campuses, but that is accentuated by disinformation campaigns and other types of trolling, which is the second front. We've kind of talked about cancel culture, especially in the other episode, but what about disinformation? How do we fight that? Well, it's a big and important topic. And I said, wow, because it's a challenging topic. So humans are not really very well wired when it comes to figuring out truth, at least not in the big picture, where we're pretty good about issues that are of immediate importance to our lives and well-being, where we get rapid feedback, like, is that a tiger in the bush or just a breeze? Or where is the next tribe camp? When you get to bigger questions of knowledge, more abstract things, like what is the cause of the illness that is hurting our children? We tend to go with stuff like, did you see the way that Juliet person looked at me? She hexed me. She's a witch. Uh, We tend to go with stuff like that. And then someone else will go with, well, no, actually it's your fault because you're praying to the wrong God. You're bringing God's wrath down. And so now we're at war. So there are deep cognitive vulnerabilities in humans. And there are things like, one is 
confirmation bias. We tend to look for and gather information that confirms what we already want to believe, whether because it's good for our prestige or because it harmonizes with the people around us or just because it's more fun. And that affects not only what we believe, but even what we see. You can show different people the identical soccer game. This is an experiment people run. And then ask them what they actually saw. And what they saw will depend on what, which team they actually support. Um, another big one is called conformity bias. We tend to try to harmonize our beliefs with those of the people around us, partly because evolution teaches us that the group is more likely to be right than the individual, and partly because evolution teaches us if we're out of sync with our group and get thrown out and ostracized, we die. And both of these processes are not even conscious, conforming with others and seeking confirmation. But of course, developing knowledge and having a healthy intellectual environment requires not doing both. It requires having diverse points of view so that all points of view get checked and balanced, like the US Constitution. We pit bias against bias, ambition against ambition. You have to have diverse viewpoints, including disagreeable ones. You have to push people to put their views out there and subject them to disagreeable criticism. We have disconfirmation bias in science. We're always looking for the holes, people's research. Well, that's really hard to get people to do. It takes a lot of institutional clout, you know, centuries of institutions and norms to build that up. And then, okay, suppose people come along and say, I'm a kleptocrat, I'm a dictator, I'm a demagogue, I'm just an opportunist and want to get rich and famous. Um, by disrupting this whole system. I want to substitute my own narrative, say that, I don't know, uh, that I won the 2020 election, even though I didn't. Um, what do you do? Well, you can attack all of these cognitive vulnerabilities in humans. You can do stuff like um, you can exploit repetition bias. If you tell a lie again and again, people will forget that it's a lie. They'll just remember having heard it, and it will embed itself in their brains. Even refuting a lie will often embed it deeper, have the opposite effect. You can use a tactic called firehose of falsehood disinformation. This is where you put out so many lies, exaggerations, half-truths, and conspiracy theories so fast, at such high volumes, through so many different channels, that you're not necessarily trying to persuade anyone. You're just trying to confuse and disorient people so they no longer even know the difference between what's true and what's false. They're not even sure there is a difference anymore. Their trust is demolished. This is a classic Russian tactic, which is repurposed brilliantly by Trump and his MAGA movement post-election. You remember 60 lawsuits, every conceivable type of conspiracy theory. Didn't matter that they were ungrounded and inconsistent with each other. Just confuse people. Um, conspiracy theories build on these cognitive vulnerabilities. You know, we humans, we look for causes for stuff. We look for agents, even where there are none. Um, Algorithms can be used to spread the bad stuff. You can try it in real time. Uh, if a piece of disinformation goes viral, you can amplify it with bots. Trolling, another disinformation technique, it's attention hijacking. Even if we try to ignore someone who says, I don't know, Jonathan Rausch has sex with farm animals and then strangles them to death. Um, I'll feel that I must rise to that and, re and refute it. I can't ignore it. It'll demolish my reputation. But trolling people allows you to seize the agenda. Um, even if you know you shouldn't respond, it's very hard not to. So you put all of that stuff together and more, and you have a whole sophisticated battery of disinformation tactics that can be used and have been used and are being used by people like, say, Vladimir Putin in Russia and Donald Trump and his MAGA movement at home. And they're being used with fantastic success. Example A is that two-thirds or more of Republicans believe the 2020 election was stolen. Do you think that there is a possibility that the constitution of knowledge could slip away entirely from our society? Oh, yeah. There's always that possibility. It's like the U.S. Constitution. It, on the one hand, it's very robust and it's very fragile. It's robust in the sense that you've got institutions all over the world and people who are trained in the constitution of knowledge and they're doing fantastic things like creating coronavirus vaccines. But on the other hand, it's fragile because for all the reasons we're discussing, it's so counterintuitive. I mean, like think what you're having at, at UVA, right? It is 
hard to create an environment where people feel comfortable criticizing each other's views, putting themselves out there um, for intellectual contestation. And then if they lose an argument, trying a different argument. It takes a lot of work to do that. So, And you can culturally, what you're describing to me is an institution that's in the process of becoming unmoored from the constitution of knowledge, at least as far as the student experience goes. So that's why I wrote this book, Juliet. Um, the whole point of the constitution of knowledge, like the U.S. constitution, is we must be ever vigilant in understanding it, understanding that it's fragile, and that we have to defend it, and we have to do right by it, or we we do lose it. I don't want to lose it. So this, I think trolling and all that is, and disinformation is definitely more of an issue with social media. How do we fight against that? I mean, I know you mentioned not responding when someone is trolling you, but how else? Is there anything that we can do? Oh, well, yeah, there's a lot. Um, but, but if you mean we as individuals or we as a society or we as social media companies, because it's it's all of the above. Individuals first, more for now, probably, but all of the above, we all need to do something. So improving our social media hygiene would help a lot. And to some extent, it's already helping. But, you know, don't repeat stuff that isn't carefully sourced just because it's funny. A lot of people won't understand that it's satire. Um, adding some friction to social media so that it just slows us down a bit. Uh, that's an important behavioral change. In terms of the the dragging that goes on, the shaming campaigns, uh, canceling, as we discussed in your early episode, is a form of information warfare. It's about manipulating the social environment to intimidate a whole lot of people so that a small minority can essentially hijack and dominate the conversation. So we can refuse to join trolling campaigns and cancel campaigns. And in fact, we can go to our friends or people even who are not our friends, people we may strongly disagree with and go to them and say, what's happening to you is wrong and I support you and then support them in public. That's hard to do. It takes a certain amount of courage to say, you know, I may disagree with Juliet, but the people shaming her should be ashamed themselves. Defending someone else's speech, um, you know, it's hard, but it's very important. Another thing we can do that, that makes a big difference is we're confronted with a choice. When, when we're trolled or when we hear something that's offensive, um, you asked at the outset of the show, what's, what's the one thing that you would want students to know that they don't? And I gave you an answer, but, but there were a lot of other possible answers. And, and here's another, which is a lot of people are coming to college now either with the notion or then getting the notion that if someone says something to you that you don't like, you've been microaggressed. You've had an act of violence committed against you. And this is a violation of your rights and you should be as offended as you possibly can. You should take it to the administration. You should launch charges, um, make a big federal case out of it. Well, actually, try doing the opposite. In a society that has lots of people with lots of opinions and sometimes well-intentioned conversations that go awry, try dialing your reaction down to annoyance instead of up to outrage. I mean, we forget. Words are not violence. We have a choice in how we receive them. If they're in a foreign language, we don't even understand them. <laughs> That's so, a good point. Yeah. I mean, we can make a choice in how offended we choose to be and in a climate where everyone is maximally dialing up the offensiveness or offendedness, I should say, for political advantage, that's an anti-intellectual chilled environment where learning and conversation and intellectual progress are not happening. So, so I tell people, just, just dial it down. Microaggressed. Big deal. It's micro, right? Let the conversation continue. Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe they'll learn something. Instead of going to the administration with a complaint because you heard something said in class that you didn't like, go to the student and tell them, hey, what were you getting at there? It sounded kind of wrong to me. Or go to the professor and say, you know, that point you made, I think it overlooked something. But have the conversations instead of launching the investigations. Thank you so much. I could talk to you about this for hours, but it is time to wrap up. What is one thing you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? 
It might be fair to ask what what one thing I I didn't change my position on, but the most relevant one for this conversation is one that we already touched on, which is 30 years ago when I wrote my my first big book on on intellectual freedom and progress. I thought the marketplace of ideas was enough. And I thought the main task and maybe the only task really was was defending freedom, freedom of speech. And I still think that's very, very important. Don't get me wrong, Juliet. But in the last five years, seeing the success of disinformation campaigns and chilling and canceling, um, I've come to realize that I was wrong about that. And that like so many people, I had been ignoring the real heart of the problem, which is how to create institutions and environments where knowledge can thrive. Not just free speech, it won't happen automatically. It requires all of us to follow certain rules and to defend those rules. And, and that's, that's been a very big change in my outlook. And it's, it's going to be the source of a lot of the work I'll be doing going forward. I'm looking forward to it. I do think it's a very important thing. And you're changing my mind too. I do think that without the constitution of knowledge, free speech doesn't really, not it doesn't matter. It's obviously a virtue that is very important, but it loses its significance if the people aren't taking advantage of it, I would yes, say. And it's if we necessary, aren't- but not sufficient. And to be honest, you know, it's it makes me sad to hear your account of being disappointed in the intellectual environment at UVA. I don't know how you can change that, but I know that you can. It actually, it turns out, sociologists will tell you, it doesn't necessarily take many people to very significantly alter a social environment for the worse or for the better. And I think that within the next year and two years, especially you know, once you're back on campus with people, I think that you will find ways in which you can use your personal agency, your connections to friends, your voice and advocacy to begin building back the intellectual climate you're looking for. I honestly believe you can do that. And I can't tell you up front, I know how you will do it, but I think you probably will. Well, that gives me a lot of hope. And I mean, that is is my goal. So I will go about trying to do that and I'll let you know how it goes. I'll look forward to that. And the beginning is understanding that there's a job to be done. Well, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my guest once again for their time and insight. I would also like to thank everyone who listens, subscribes, and shares the Great Antidote podcast. If you would like to be on the podcast, have a guest in mind, or have a topic in mind, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at thecgo.org. Catch you next time. Bye.